So we've got some more data mined Marvel Snap cards. These are set to release in the September season, and there's a couple pretty crazy ones. I think one insanely high high power leveled card, and then some wacky stuff like Loki here behind me. Now, fair warning: these are data mined cards. These are not final. Typically, the text on these remains the same at this stage. You should expect the effects of these to be to be right, but sometimes the numbers do get tweaked a little bit late in the process, so something might get a buff or a nerf along the way, but even the text we can't guarantee. Just very likely, these are the cards as we see them in September. So first off here is Loki, which will be the season pass card. And he is a 3-4 with on reveal, replace your hand with cards from your opponent's starting deck and then give them negative one cost. So, uh, hey, you don't like your deck? Don't worry about it, you can just play your opponents, which sounds really, really fun. Like taking their cards and getting a discount on them. It's like, hey, I'm doing what you're doing, but way better, you fool. <laughs> that is indeed uh, a really enjoyable idea. And uh, the way this works, at least I expect based on this wording is, I think when you say replace, you'll need cards in hand, of course, uh, to, to get a copy of your opponents. So for instance, if you played this on turn three after having not played anything, you should be getting five cards in hand. You normally have four cards in hand on turn one, five cards in hand on turn two, six cards in hand on turn three, but Loki's one of those. Uh, so five cards replaced. So you'll be getting five of your opponent's things. Now, interestingly, you know, five out of 12 is not a complete deck and therefore you might be missing out on certain synergies or card pairings that your opponent is more likely to hit than you are. So your five cards, even though yours are cheaper, they won't necessarily always be quite as strong as your opponents because they'll have uh, kind of a better idea of what their deck is doing and, and unfolding a curve on time for their deck. For instance, you know, if their deck is built around like collector stuff, they play collector on two and then they play Colson on three and they're filling their hand for a devil dinosaur, right? And they've got all these lines unfolding that are leading them to their win condition. If you just get a random assortment of stuff, number one, you might get like low cost stuff that you didn't have a chance to play earlier. So that might feel like you're kind of just throwing away some low power things. You might also miss the chance to play things in order and sequence that are best beneficial for the deck. Or you might even just miss specific card pairings as well, where two cards are designed to go really well together and you only got one of them. Or you might miss like the really important win condition card of the deck, like a MODOK, for instance, in a discard deck. You might get all the discard synergy stuff and then no MODOK and your life might be really awkward, whereas your opponent has a much higher chance to draw into their MODOK throughout the course of a game by turn five uh, than you do because they'll just see a, a larger portion of their deck uh, at that stage. So in some ways you're getting their deck, but better, but in other ways, it's going to be a little bit more awkward to play their deck. That said, I still think there will be plenty of moments where you just hit some awesome big threats and you get to play them more affordably than your opponent. You get to play an awesome five cost high evolutionary Hulk or something that's, that's insane. Although I guess the way high evolutionary Hulk just got changed and maybe that's actually not as good because it won't be in hand long enough, but you know what I mean? Like you get to play their awesome big cards and, and benefit from the cost discounts. I think there are also some things you can do to support this more directly, things like play Collector on turn two so that you uh, get an immediate buff. Whatever your Loki hits, I guess in that case, you'd be getting four cards in hand. So like a plus four to your Collector, that could be great and uh, a useful way to, uh, to get some more immediate and direct impact from your Loki as opposed to the sort of indirect game plan. It's also worth noting that you'll still be drawing your own cards after you do this. You'll draw your own cards on four, five, and six. So it's not like you'll be... Uh, completely helpless with just your opponent's stuff if it doesn't line up or it's very hard to use. So I think deck construction around this will be really important, making sure that your own cards can either fill in the gaps or give you a consistent backup plan where even if you don't hit good stuff, you still have plays to make and things to do off the top of your deck. So I, it's gonna be intriguing whether you want to draw like low cost stuff to fill in or if you want to draw high cost stuff to make sure that you have high powered plays and your hand isn't too low value basically after copying your opponents i think there's you know fears this is probably not a good meta example right now but you're playing like a zoo deck and you get a bunch of one drops but you don't get a blue marvel it's like oh man i just dumped all of this stuff and i don't really have any great way to pay this off and now my top decks are also weak I'm just not gonna have enough power to win the game. So answering those kind of questions from a deck building standpoint is gonna be the challenge for Loki 
and I think uh, definitely require some refinement and fine tuning to get this card into a place where it makes sense in a deck. Now, ultimately, all of that said, I, I do feel like this card's going to lean a little bit more towards the fun or meme side of things as opposed to the competitive side of the gameplay. Just because I think most decks want a really reliable, consistent game plan. They want to be able to snap confidently. That's the stuff you want when you're climbing the ladder to know what your deck is doing, to hit things as consistently as you can. And Loki, although very fun in the fact that he introduces so much chaos, may not feel very competitive because of all that chaos. That can be really hard to plan around, really hard to snap around. And, you know, at the end of the day, you are kind of just playing a three cost, four power unit too, which doesn't usually feel great. Uh, you know, it's kind of a downturn. You may be skipping your first two turns to enable the Loki. So your early game kind of sucks. And then you're hoping for this big pop off later that wins, but does Loki do enough to set that pop up off? Pop off up. That's the way you say that. I don't, I don't know. I don't think so, right? There might be metas where he's more beneficial than others, but uh, my suspicion is this will be really fun, really enjoyable for a while, and that's that's probably fine. It's okay for cards to just be good, but then kind of falls off as people, you know, wear off on the novelty of this idea and the fun of it, and probably doesn't look all that competitive at the end of the day, but maybe I'm underestimating this one cost discount. Maybe that just makes Loki so insane that it's worth it. Sarah is definitely a good card, so it's not impossible. I'm curious where you guys think this will land on that spectrum. More fun or more powerful? Of course, somewhere in the middle, but I'm leaning more towards the fun side than the power side personally. So next up here, we've got Eliath. At least I think that's how you say it. I watched this Loki show, but I, I can't remember the names. And I think this card is going to be completely bonkers. Eliath is a 5-5 on reveal destroy all enemy cards played here this turn including unrevealed cards which uh makes this like the master of head-to-head -head fights in a uh, a single location Eliath just wipes out basically anything that your opponent might want to do whether that's a big singular threat they want to plop down a hulk too bad Eliath wipes it out if they want to plop down four crazy cards in a bounce deck doesn't matter all four are going to get destroyed by your Eliath, which basically a vast majority of the time is going to ensure that you win that location uh with Eliath, which going into the final turn is going to be a huge asset knowing that you're very very likely to win a given spot i think this will often be played in fact in combination with something like kitty pride so you have this just crazy one-two punch on turn six or you're dropping Eliath to guarantee shore up one spot and then dropping Kitty Pride to put you very favored in that other spot as well, uh, which is going to be really, really tough for a lot of decks to beat. Uh, this text here is saying including unrevealed cards is also pretty important as well, because even if, if your opponent tries to disrupt this in some way or stop it, they want to play a Cosmo to interrupt this on reveal. If you've got priority... It doesn't matter. The Cosmo gets wiped out earlier. Uh, and if they have any on reveals, they, they, they try to sneak around this. You know, if they got a white tiger, they want to send a tiger somewhere else. Too bad it's getting uh, wiped out before it even gets revealed. So they don't even get the reveals in this case. So not many ways to really play around this necessarily either. Now, the one thing is, of course, you have to call your shot. You have to pick the location where this is going to be most relevant and where it's going to connect. And if you don't do that, it might feel like it's wasted. But honestly, at five power, sometimes that's going to be enough to flip and contest a location anyway. If you're down by four, you can still play Eliath, still flip that location. If your opponent does decide to shore it up and commit to it, Eliath is going to wipe it out. If they don't, Eliath is going to contest it anyway. So I think a vast majority of the time you'll be able to play this exactly where it needs to be, and it'll be very, very relevant to making sure you win the spots that you need. You might be way ahead in one spot already, and then Eliath makes a difference somewhere else, making sure you've got that uh, two lo locations secured. It's also worth noting that th this can be played on turn five as well, right? Just try to hit their big, awesome five cost thing. The, the you know, Devil Dinosaur, the Iron Man, often it's somewhat predictable where those sorts of things go. If cards like Gamora can get played, we certainly think Goliath can as well because it's kind of like a super Gamora. Who cares about going for power when you can just wipe out your opponent's stuff? And the floor on it's not that much different at five versus seven power anyway. But the upside on this is completely crazy compared to the Gamora's upside. She gets plus five if she hits. This could get like plus 15 if it hits the right sort of targets, right? Or, or even more, really. Uh, so pretty nuts in, in, in that case as well. But, but when you play it on turn five, you actually have some crazy follow-ups. There's obvious stuff like Null on six, you know, for like destroy synergies. But what about Absorbing Man? Play this on five to win a spot and then play Absorbing Man on six. And it's like, you're locked up. You know what I mean? Like you're, you're just good to go. Like that's gonna be amazing. 
at, at securing locations. So I, I don't know, man. This card's effect is just so universal in its removal. It's so swingy. It's got a great base stat line to boot, honestly. I, I just don't see how this doesn't get played. I can see this in like tempo decks, kind of like we saw with like leader and arrow back in the day. Just play a bunch of stats early and then use this to make sure you're locking up a spot. Maybe you got a, uh, like I said, a kitty pride in there to support that. I could see this certainly in lockdown control decks, which are very often isolating uh, a location early, locking it off with storm or something, ensuring that they're gonna win that spot. That one's secured, that's done. And then we use a Lyoth on the other spot we're trying to win and we guarantee that as well on turn six. Seems like an absolutely perfect fit for control decks, which are already a good and big part of the meta. So uh, I, I think this card is gonna be awesome. Maybe even frustratingly so, it's gonna feel really hard to beat this one sometimes or you feel like you're hopeless with the Eliath shots, uh, you know. So, uh, looks really, really good to me. I don't think it's gonna be super hard to predict this or, or construct scenarios where Eliath is very likely to connect, or it doesn't matter if it connects or not, because it's just enough power that you might be winning anyway if your opponent decides to forego an actual play into your Eliath location. So, I wouldn't be shocked if the numbers on this one got pulled down prior to release. Maybe this is a 5-3 or something, so it's not quite as good at, at, uh, at flipping locations, even if the opponent doesn't play to them, but all in all, this to me looks like a very, very strong card. So next up here is Mobius M. Mobius. I don't even remember that being this dude's name. I need to rewatch Loki season one. Now, there's so much I don't remember about this show, apparently. Maybe season two is coming out with his, with his hits. Maybe that's why it's all uh, Loki themed. This is a two, three ongoing. Your costs can't be increased and your opponent's costs can't be reduced. So uh, this is a pretty interesting tech card for things like Sarah decks, for instance, they're looking for those big turn six payoffs where the Sarah has discounted or Zabu decks too. We know Zabu is a really powerful and important piece of the meta uh, time and time again. This could answer that Zabu even on turn two. It's like, oh, they play the Zabu, you play the Mobius to match. You've actually gained a little power already. Yay, and their Zabu is shut down. So if you wanna keep things a little bit more honest, your Mobius uh, could be a great way to limit your opponent kind of advancing some of those plays out early and play things straight up. I don't know exactly what kind of deck would best utilize the fact that they've limited their opponent's discounts in that way, uh, but maybe just an ongoing synergy here, you toss it in with some ongoing cards and a spectrum. Maybe, uh, you know, we've got these kind of, uh, I would say, you know, variable slots in a lot of decks, things like Jeff often make their way in there in the two drop spot. Uh, this might just be an alternative. Certain metas may prefer a card like this over something like Jeff just to limit the opponent's plays. Make sure you're not going to get completely blown out by uh, some of those Sarah decks down the road. Now, of course, there's the other side of this as well, which is protecting your own interests, making sure that your costs can't be increased, which I think as a kind of like proactive game plan is probably a little bit less interesting. Like, I don't know how often you're really gonna be like worried about that so much that you feel like you need a card to protect against that, like running it as a dedicated spot in your deck to protect an, an, a curve may not be that relevant, but if Iceman's really getting you down, if you're running a combo deck that requires a perfect sequence of, of plays on time, you gotta hit the Wong into whatever on curve, maybe you could put a Mobius in there to make sure things like Iceman don't mess with you or locations don't mess with you just to ensure uh, that your your plans unfold as expected so it's a possibility i don't i don't think that's going to be a common use case for this card but uh certainly something to keep in mind for him anyway so i don't know we've seen some of these like sneaky techish type cards things like ghost come to mind you know these cards that do something cool and and, and change the way the game unfolds but they don't necessarily have a lot of direct power or influence over a game they don't necessarily do anything really actively or significant and often those kind of get left at the wayside for synergies and game plans that are putting power into play, that are driving towards an actual game plan or win condition. This doesn't feel like it does that necessarily. It's a little bit more incidental, a little bit more complimentary, and often decks don't really make space for a card like this one. So I don't expect to see Mobius M Mobius everywhere all over the meta, but sometimes when the perfect kind of Zabu counter is required or Sarah counter, you know, this is maybe a release valve of sorts in the meta. Like as those things get too powerful, maybe Mobius starts getting teched in, pulling their win rates down a little bit. So cards like this existing is important. Maybe just not a card we see every day. And that's, that's probably fine for something like this. So finally here we have Ravana Rinslayer. A, again, I, I don't remember how to say her name. <laughs> this show is <laughs> Ravana, Ravona, Ravana. I don't know, Rinslayer is her name. This is a 3-3 three, three. with ongoing. Your cards with one or less power 
cost one less. So here's another example, by the way, where Mobius and Mobius might be important. You got Zabu, you got Ravana, you got uh, Sarah, probably some other examples I'm not thinking of. All of those can be countered by Mobius. So again, nice to release Falth. Uh, but she's pretty cool. So your cards with one or less power cost one less, and that's a minimum of one. And of course, we know there are a ton of really powerful cards with one or less power. And we often see them actually uh, in Mr. Negative decks because Mr. Negative deck loves zero power things so they can flip them and make them super affordable and, and crazy to play. So you got your Iron Mans, your Mystiques, your Artem Zolas of the world. There are countless other examples, particularly on reveal cards or another direction to go there. So, you know, your White Tigers can cost a little less. Your, uh, your Iron Hearts, your... Well, Gambit would have been an example, but Gambit just got buffed to 3-3. Three, three, so Gambit is no longer example. Um, so it, you know, a lot of stuff basically does live in this space of one or less power, which I think you could maybe build an entire deck just dedicated to Ravana. Much like we see Zabu Sarah stuff as discounters. Ravana might be, uh, you know, instead of Zabu Sarah, maybe it's Ravana Sarah. And you've got like an on reveal Sarah deck package that benefits a bunch uh, from dis discounts here with uh, Miss Rinslayer. So that's a possibility. I also think you could maybe use this as a backup in a Mr. Negative deck. Like if you don't hit your Mr. Negative, maybe it's nice to have Rinslayer here as a backup plan so that you can still get some nice discounts on your stuff. I don't know that that would be worth it because I don't know that like a four cost White Tiger or four cost Iron Man is good enough to be exciting, but it's a possibility at least to consider for this card. Uh, it probably does not interact well if you also play Mr. Negative for the record. I assume once that happens, you have a zero five Iron Man. He no longer has one less, one or less power, so he would no longer be discounted. So that would be a bit redundant and unnecessary, but as a backup plan, still a possibility. I think that deck would just prefer to have more things that are zero and just ride the highs of Mr. Negative than have that kind of fallback plan because that deck's all about accruing cubes when you hit, not about minimizing your losses. Whatever the case may be, this is you know a significant discount. We know this can be meaningful and it may take a while to get enough cards to come together to really support this, but there's already quite a few that make sense to me and uh, putting together an on reveal deck in particular for this card probably makes sense. So I wouldn't be shocked at all if this just gets there as is, but another card that just gets better over time as more and more of these options get added into the pool for her. Uh, so definitely a card to keep in mind. These cost discount cards time and time again have been really good. Zabu's great. Sarah's great. Both really powerful cards. I could expect Rinslayer to slot into a very, very similar spot here. Okay, so those are the four cards for September. I'll, of course, give these star ratings when we get uh, closer to September for the final reviews, when we know what the meta looks like a little bit more. But for now, I thought I'd rank these cards for you in my expectations for how powerful they're going to be. So a number one pick is obviously Alioth. This stands above the rest by a mile. This looks insanely good to me. My number two choice is uh, Ravona Renslayer here. I think this discount's really nice. Uh, my number three choice is probably Mobius in Mobius. I think this has a pretty limited utility, but uh, I, I think at least has the chance to be tossed in the decks here and there. And then finally, I think Loki is primarily going to be a card designed around fun more than competitiveness. So although he might get played a lot initially, I think he probably falls off and ends up being the fourth most played card overall, because uh, at least from a competitive standpoint, I mean, people may still want to play this for fun. I certainly will enjoy taking my opponent's stuff. That sounds awesome. But, uh, you know, I, I think this has the, the least consistent and likely competitive outcome long term. But I'm curious what your rankings are for these cards. Which ones do you think are going to stand above the rest? Share those thoughts in the comments down below. Thanks so much as always for watching. And until next time, game on.